All right. Well, thank you, Elijah. Um, our text this morning will be from the first epistle of John. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 28 of chapter 2. I'm going to read through verse 10 of chapter 3. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. All right, well, as most of you know, I have three boys, three young boys. They range in age from five years old to about three weeks old. And um, being a parent of young children is a bizarre experience. As you know, if you've gone through this, it is a bizarre experience. It's a particular particularly bizarre experience during a global pandemic. Because during a global pandemic, everyone around you is saying things like this. They're saying, stand six feet away from me. Cover your mouth when you cough. Don't touch your face. Um, you know, wear a mask. Saying all these things. Meanwhile, as a parent, you're saying things like this. Stop licking the bottom of my shoe. Get your, toe, get your brother's toes out of your mouth. Do not lick the toilet bowl. Um, or my personal favorite, uh, stop reusing the toothpaste from my spit. So I'm standing with, with one of my children at the sink, brushing my teeth, and you know, spit out, and my, my boy's like, oh, you know, more toothpaste, and he keeps going. So you realize that you're living in sort of a different reality when you're a, a parent of young children, right? Um, but being a parent is not only a bizarre experience, uh, it's also a very humbling experience, very humbling experience. Before I was a parent, um, I thought that I was a very patient, very uh, even-keeled, uh, very uh, um, you know, calm person, right? Um, and then I became a parent, and I realized, oh, I'm actually a psycho. Um, I, I remember um, w when my son was born, um, you know, shortly after he was born, just holding him and looking into his, his beautiful little face, and I thought, as he was a baby, I thought, I just don't understand how I will ever be able to discipline this child. I mean, how could I ever spank this beautiful, precious little angel? Well, fast forward two years, um, and I'm, I'm walking out, out of a restaurant uh, holding my child as he is screaming and flailing. You, you've all uh, perhaps been through this experience where you have to leave an establishment because your child has lost his mind. And I, I look down his beautiful little face, and I think... I could seriously strangle this child right now. Um, so being, again, being a parent is a humbling experience. Now, don't get me wrong. Being a parent is a wonderful experience. It's a beautiful experience. I love being a father. It's the best thing in the world. But it is a humbling experience. Being a parent makes you so keenly aware of your own shortcomings and your own sins and how much growth you have uh, needed still in your life. So, when we come to a passage here in 1 John, it presents us with a real problem, a real puzzle. These, these things that um, John says here, no one who is born of God commits sin. Um, the one who is born of God cannot sin. He says the same thing, by the way, if you flip over um, in your Bibles to the end of John in, in verse 18 of chapter 5, he says, we know that no one who is born of God sins. No one who is born of God sins. And um, notice, by the way, that it's not, if, if all John says was no one who abides in him sins, we might think, well, 
okay, so you, you, as a Christian, you abide in Christ, but maybe sometimes you are sort of out of fellowship, uh, you're, and so you, um, you know, might sin in that moment. But what he says is that no one who is born of God sins, right? And uh, he, he defines in the first verse of chapter 5 what it means to be born of God, right? He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, right? So it seems to say all Christians are born of God, and uh, no one who is born of God sins. No one can sin who is born of God. Now, um, uh, it's not, by the way, just a general principle either. It's not just like, you know, typically, as a rule of thumb, people who are born of God don't sin. That, that doesn't quite seem to do justice to the strength of his language there, especially at the end of verse 9 where he says no, he, uh, he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Um, but surely it is possible for Christians to sin, right? Throughout the New Testament, there are so many passages which seem to indicate that it's at least possible that Christians sin. Um, take, for example, as just one passage of many we could cite, think of James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins to one another, right? It certainly seems to suggest that Christians can sin. But we don't even have to go outside of this book in 1 John. Um, there are many passages which seem to suggest that Christians can sin. In uh, chapter 1, verse 8, uh, if anyone says he has no sin, um, he is deceiving himself, right? Uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, uh, little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. It certainly seems to suggest that it's possible for them to sin, right? And then uh, he goes on in the very next statement to say, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So certainly seems to indicate that Christians can sin. And then uh, at, the, at the end of the book, in chapter 5, verse 16, he explicitly describes a brother committing a sin. Um, so uh, what, what in the world are we to make of this? Um, how can we reconcile what John says here with our own experience and also with what uh, the rest of the scripture says and with what John himself seems to say elsewhere in the same epistle? Well, if you have an NIV or an ESV, uh, there is a ready explanation given to you. Um, they they, they, uh, change, uh, they uh, translate these verbs uh, as keep on sinning or continue to sin or make a practice of sinning. Okay? Now, um, the idea here is that the, the Greek present tense in this context is conveying a habitual action. So what John is saying is that the Christian cannot sin habitually. Um, well, I don't want to get, get too far off in the weeds on Greek grammar, um, but we, you know, we do need to say a word about this. And I, I think that this uh, is not uh, justified, this, this translation. Um, the English present tense can also convey the habitual sense, right? I can say I bike to work. That means I, bi I bike habitually to work. I'm, I'm in the habit of biking to work. Um, so why is it that we need to change the translation here if the English tense can uh, so sometimes convey a habitual sense? Why do we need to add words like keeps on or continue to? Well, it's because no English reader who, who reads, uh, you know, he cannot sin is going to hear that as he cannot make a habit of sinning, right? Um, and I, I would say the same for the original Greek readers. I see no reason uh, uh, that the original Greek readers would have been any more likely than modern English readers to interpret the present tense in this particular context as conveying habitual action. Um, and uh, we can note here there are 284 present tense verbs in 1 John. And it is only in these verbs that create a problem for us theologically that the translators uh, insert the words uh, continue to or keep on. And it's it's uh, even the same verb to sin. Uh, it, it occurs in the present tense in chapter 5, verse 16, to speak of the brother who sins, right? And there they don't say keep on sinning or continue to sin. Um, so it's, it's a very inconsistent translation. And I'll just uh, share one anecdote here. I uh, happened to be uh, to hear once a talk that was given by Bill Mounts, who is a a uh, prominent Greek scholar. He wrote the most popular Greek grammar. And he sat on the NIV translation committee. And he said that it, there, there was one, ver or one place in the entire translation of the New Testament where the NIV committee allowed their theological interest to override what the Greek grammar indicated. And that was here in 1 John, um, that they, they recognized that the Greek grammar really didn't justify this, but they felt that it was too dangerous to, uh, to, to give the idea that Christians can't sin. Okay, so again, uh, I, I think it's unjustified from the Greek grammar. 
I also think that it doesn't make sense logically within the argument of this passage. Um, remember, John opens his epistle by saying, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Um, so he, he emphasizes that there's no darkness at all in God, there's no sin at all in God. So it doesn't make much sense to say, uh, no one who is born of God sins very much, uh, right? Or, or sins too excessively, right? The, the logic of the epistle seems to point to God is without sin, so those who are born of God are without sin. Also notice the comparison with Jesus. Uh, if you look at verses 5 and 6, um, he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. Um, so it's not just that Jesus didn't sin habitually or didn't sin continually. Jesus didn't sin at all, and that seems to be the sort of comparison that John is making here. All right, so we're kind of digging ourselves into a hole, aren't we? Uh, on the one hand, it seems pretty clear that uh, John and the New Testament say we can't sin, but on the other hand, there doesn't seem to be an easy way of evading uh, the force of the language here in uh, John th uh, 3, verse 6, and verse 9, and uh, 5, verse 18, which suggests that no one who is born of God sins. Okay, well, there's one other point uh, that we should mention here that's often overlooked, I think, in this discussion, and uh, that is that in the Johannine literature, intentional contradictions are often used. Um, it's sort of an uh, interesting feature of the Johannine literature. So in John 9, Jesus says, for judgment, I came into the world. In John 12, Jesus says, I did not come to judge the world. Um, in John 8, 15, Jesus says, I judge no one. In John 8, 26, Jesus says, I have many things to say and to judge about you. Um, in John 7, Jesus says, you both know me and know where I'm from. In the next chapter, Jesus says, you do not know where I'm from. You know neither me nor my father. Uh, my favorite one here, John 13, Simon Peter said to him, where are you going? In uh, John 16, the same discourse, the same conversation, uh, Jesus says, not one of you asked me, where are you going? I imagine Peter said, now, wait, I just asked that question, right? Um, and then uh, even uh, oh, uh, in, in, um, in John 5, Jesus says, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. And 8, he says, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is valid. And uh, here in 1 John, um, I am not writing a new commandment to you. Next verse, I am writing a new commandment to you. Right? So this seems to be an intentional feature of uh, the Johannine literature. And the reader understands that John is not being sloppy here. It's not like, oh, I forgot what I said a few verses ago. No, um, the attentive reader understands that both of these statements are intended. We, the, the, the attentive reader understands both of these statements are true. And the, this way of writing uh, you know, provokes the reader to think about this at a deeper level and think how both of these things can be true. So take, for example, I am not writing a new commandment to you, and then I am writing a new commandment to you. Well, we understand it's a different sense of new, right? It's not a new commandment in the sense that it's not something they haven't heard before, like you've heard this before, but it is a new commandment in the sense that it's part of the new age. It's part of the newness that Christ brings, right? Um, so um, I, how, how then do we unravel this uh, seemingly... Con contradictory statement that we find here that, um, you know, I write these things to you that you may not sin, and then, uh, you know, no one who's born of God is able to sin. Well, I think perhaps um, the key to uh, understanding what John uh, is saying here is in the opening part of chapter 3. Let me read those opening verses again. Um, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So um, while we are children of God, uh, John says we are not yet what we will be. Um, clearly, uh, John believes that Christians are born of God, that they are children of God, but he apparently also views this identity as something that has not yet been manifested in its fullness. Um, and we can see the same idea expressed in Paul. Notice the differences throughout Paul's letters and how he talks about the old self and the new self. Um, in Romans 6, he says, our old self was crucified with him, right? And similarly, in Colossians 3, he says, uh, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. But then notice how he, the language he uses in Ephesians 4. 
uh, he says, he, he uh, it exhorts the Ephesians to lay aside the old self, which is being corrupt, corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Okay, so how can Paul say to the Colossians, on the one hand, that um, they have put on the new man, and yet exhort the Ephesians that, you know, you need to put on the new man. That's something you need to be doing. Um, well, in order to understand this, I think we've, we first need to say that the old man and the new man are not parts of us. They're not components of us. Um, it's not like in the cartoon where you've got the shoulder angel and the shoulder devil, you know, these two natures that are battling inside of you. Um, I, I don't think that's what's meant here. I think John Stott uh, had it exactly right when he said uh, concerning the passage in Romans that we just read. He said, what was crucified with Christ was not part of me called my old nature, but the whole whole of me as I was before I was converted. Um, and Douglas Moo uh, says the same thing here. He says the assumption that old man and new man refers to parts or natures of a person is incorrect. Rather, they designate the person as a whole. These phrases look at the person as one who belongs to the old age or the new, respectively. Okay, so the old self is who you were in the old age. The new self is who you are in the new age. But of course, we live between the ages, right? The new age has dawned, but it has not yet come in all of its fullness. This is the already not yet tension that we find throughout the New Testament. Um, and so the call to put on the new man that we find in Ephesians is the call to be who you already are in Christ, right? The call to put on the new man is the call to be who you already are. And notice, by the way, uh, how Paul describes the new man. If we re recall what uh, we read there in Ephesians 4, he describes the, the new self, uh, he says, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Okay, so the new self is created like God in righteousness and holiness. The new self doesn't sin, right? The new self is holy. The new self is righteous. Um, so I think we have the same thing happening here in 1 John. I think um, on, on, on my view, um, this is, I think, the, the, the way we should understand what Paul or what John is saying here in chapter 3. I think I. Howard Marshall in his commentary on 1 John gets it exactly right. He says uh, what John is describing here when he talks about no one who is born of God sins, no one who's born of God can sin, is the eschatological reality. Um, what, what John is doing then is... is Marshall says, uh, the, the message of this passage is become who you are. Become who you are. You are a child of God. Become who you are. Children of God do not sin. Um, so uh, in, in conclusion here, uh, there are uh, two things that uh, I, I think we should take from this passage and this very strong language that we find here in 1 John. Um, the first is that sin is unnatural. For the Christian, sin is unnatural. Uh, it is it, when you sin, you are not uh, living in your identity as a child of God. Um, so it, it is so easy in uh, our our world to think of sin as natural. Um, if my children are misbehaving, it seems very natural for me to lose my temper with them, right? If um, if I'm stressed out by what's going on in my work or other, you know, other things in life, then it seems very natural to be short with my wife or, or with uh, my family. Um, if I have some bills piling up, it seems very natural to give in to anxiety, give in to worry. But what the message of 1 John is, is that for the child of God, sin is not natural. Sin is not um, part of who we are uh, as children of God. Um, so the first, the first point there, sin is unnatural. The second one uh, that I would say here is, is for the Christian, sin is unnecessary. Um, sin is unnecessary. I, I grew up in a Baptist church, and I uh, recall um, more, more than once, I believe, uh, the uh, spe speaker or the pastor said something like this, said, okay, you know, everyone raise your hand if you've already sinned since you got out of bed this morning, you know, it's this Sunday morning, and, and then, you know, everybody would raise their hand and uh, then the pastor would say, well, if anyone, you, if, you, if you didn't raise your hand, um, you just sinned because you told a lie, right? Um, and so it's this idea that we're just constantly sinning. Um, and I, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's what the New Testament teaches. Uh, you can and you should live in victory over sin. Um, 
Romans 6, 12 says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Do not let sin reign. Um, it's, it, you, you do not have to be enslaved to sin. You do not have to be um, dominated by sin. It is now, uh, that uh, it can, that can happen. You can let sin reign. That's what Paul's words seem to suggest, but it certainly does not have to be uh, the reality for you anymore. You can live in victory. Um, I'm, I'm reminded by those words in Romans 6 of the imagery that we find in Charles Wesley's wonderful hymn, And Can It Be? Uh, you you know, all know the words, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. So this wonderful image of uh, you know, the doors of the prison being thrown open and walking out into freedom. But Paul's warning there in, in Romans 6, 12, where he says, do not let sin reign, that suggests that it's possible for the person after the doors have been thrown open uh, and the, you know, the dungeon has flamed with light and the doors have been thrown on, open, Paul's warning suggests that it's possible for the person to look around and think, you know, this, this cell that I've been in isn't maybe as uncomfortable as I thought it was. It's not so bad. I think I'm going to stay here for a little while and I'm, I'm going to stay in this cell. Um, so that's possible. But of course, the message of the New Testament is that it, that need not be the case. Um, you can walk forward and walk out in freedom. Now, uh, I, I imagine that here uh, in the room, um, uh, my colleagues here are probably in agreement with me on this, that we can live in victory over sin, it's something we emphasize here at Wesley Biblical Seminary. But I know this message is going out. Um, it's being recorded, being broadcast, and it may be the case that there are some who are hearing this message and who think, you know, this is just not my experience. Um, perhaps you're struggling with an addiction and you think, I want to get out. I hate this. I want to get out of my prison cell, but the door is locked. I'm, I'm banging on the, the, the bars here, and I cannot get out. The door is locked. Um, since I graduated from high school in 2004, um, I, I tabulated up. I have, with, with my uh, different degrees and teaching and my wife working as a resident director, I have spent 17 years living on Christian college campuses. Uh, it's a lot of time living among uh, Christian young people. And um, one thing that comes out of that, that experience, which really burdens me is, uh, and really grieves me, is I, I've seen how um, prevalent uh, pornography addiction is among, among young men. And to say that it's rampant is really a, a, a gross understatement. I think a word like ubiquitous would be closer to the mark. Um, and so many, so many conversations I've had, so many hours spent talking with young husbands, young fathers who, who are ashamed and they, they want to follow Christ. They want to be good husbands. They want to be good fathers. Um, and uh, many, you know, this experience is... This, uh, true very much in seminary as well, spent time with many young men who are either pastors or are about to step into a, a career as a pastor and have no, can see no way out of this addiction and can see no hope. Um, and, and week after week, uh, they, uh, you know, we, they come and confess that have, haven't fallen again in, in sin. And, um, I want to be very careful here. Um, I, it, some of you may have seen uh, an old skit uh, with uh, Bob Newhart where uh, some of this uh, Stop It skit, if you, if you haven't seen this, you should just go look it up. It's hilarious. But um, he's a in the skit, he's a psychologist, and someone comes in with a problem. They have a fear of uh, being buried alive. And he's like, OK, I've got two words for you. And I want you to, to take these words home. Stop it, right? And, and so he just says, stop it, stop it. And that's all he says to her, stop it. And I certainly don't want to be like that. You know, I don't want to, don't want to take um, a, uh, you know, a, approach addiction in a very, you know, nonchalant way of just giving an easy answer, like, we'll just stop doing that, right? Um, but at the same time, um, it, it, there is a truth here, I think, that needs to be spoken. And it is, it is cruel not to speak it and uh, to out of fear of offending people or out of embarrassment to not speak um, the, the truth here. Um, and the, the truth is, is uh, this, that um, when I had these young men come to me and say, you know, I hate my sin, I want to be free, and they have a cell phone in their pocket, 
okay, I don't believe them, all right? And that may seem like a very hard thing to say and a very um, judgmental thing to say, but consider what, what would you say to a man who comes to you and says, I, um, I see that my alcohol addiction is ruining my family and I want to be free of it, I want to be rid of it. And yet every morning he, uh, uh, without fail, picks up a hip, hip flask of whiskey and sticks that into his pocket and goes about his day with that hip flask in his, his pocket. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, um, if, if uh, you want to be free of this addiction, um, you need to take drastic steps to cut off access to this. And um, if you say, my work requires me to have this, uh, requires me to have access to a cell phone, well, um, do you believe that this is, you know, how much do you value your marriage? How much do you value uh, your relationship with your children? Do you understand that without holiness, no one will see the Lord? Um, do you understand that fornicators and adulterers will not inherit the kingdom? If, if, if it is actually true that there is no way for you to work around um, having uh, uh, you know, constant access to the internet um, in your job, well, then maybe the Lord is calling you to a different job, right? Um, and again, I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to be insensitive, but I've just seen so much of the grief that comes from this, and I've seen how prevalent it is, and we need to speak the truth about this. Um, pornography addiction is not uh, some unbeatable thing that the Christian is doomed to be enslaved to. Um, the truth is that you can be free. If you are a child of God, the door of the prison is open, and you can walk out. And if you are still uh, in, in that prison, um, it is not because the door is locked. The, if you are a child of God, the door is open and you can walk out in freedom. Um, so I, I want to close uh, this morning with these words from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13. Uh, the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Let us become who we are in Jesus. All right. Well, let's, let's pray. Um, dear Father, we thank you so much for um, the incredible uh, transformation that you have made available to us through your son, Jesus. We thank you for the incredible privilege of being your children, of being brothers and sisters of Jesus. Um, and we pray that uh, you would uh, continue to conform us into the likeness of your son. We pray that we would walk in the truth of uh, our new reality, our new identity, in Jesus. Um, we uh, thank you for your love. We thank you for the freedom that you have made available to us in Jesus. It's in his num wonderful name that we pray. Amen.